God promises to be with us and make all things right. It's in our uh, vision statement. We are a church united to, to, to show God with us, making all things right. So the promise, God with us, you know, where'd that come from? What are we looking at here? The promise of God's presence, where'd that come from? So today we're going to go all the way back to Exodus 33. But before we get to Exodus 33, I need to show you how the people of Israel got in trouble. How they got in trouble, how they made God actually really angry. So we're going to have to go back to Exodus 32. We're going to end on Exodus 33. And, uh, and, and these people made God angry. And we're looking at it because in so many ways, we too can be stiff-necked people. And I use that phrase because that's the phrase that God uses. Stiff-necked people. So let's get into it. Exodus 32, 1 to 4. When the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down from the mountain... What mountain is he on? He's on Mount Sinai. He's hearing from God. He's getting all of the, this is how to set up the nation of Israel, my people. He's up there. So when the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron, who was the deputy leader. He was the vice leader. And they, they gathered themselves to Aaron and say, up! Make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So Aaron said to them, Well, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Whew. What? So here's a question. Given that passage... And given what you might know of Scripture, why did Aaron make a golden calf? Why did Aaron make a golden calf? Why did he even do that? Like, duh. What type of vice leader are you? Why did you do that? What's the logic behind Aaron making a golden calf? And I'm really curious what you guys think of that. It's just... Really, really good question. I want to hear some discussion on that. See, God is on mission. People want to see a God they can worship. God is on mission, but people really, really want good services and programs. The call for us today is to look beyond what we want and start to ask how can we join with God in what he wants? How do we do that? How do we join with God in what God wants? God wants to be with us. How do we join with God in that process? How do we join with God? The people who followed Moses, they wanted to worship God. Or in their language, El. El. Right? We've heard of El coming from El Shaddai. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other El phrases. Beth El means house of God. Right? You've got El. El is the Hebrew word for God. So they want to they worship God. And I talk a lot about the progression of the revelation of God throughout sermons. If you go back on YouTube and listen to them, you'll, you'll hear it all ever. And how religion... Human religion is a sociological reality. We see that we can't control everything, and so humans do their best to reach up to whatever is in charge, and they, and they deify whatever is in charge, sun, moon, stars, fire, water. And, and, they, and, they, and they worship, they create structures about how to follow these gods. 
That's religion reaching up. But God himself reaches down and reveals himself. And what we see through history is God has used some of the religious constructs to help people understand who he actually is. And this is that moment. This is what's happening. I want to hear a little bit about what you're saying about why did Aaron make the golden calf. If I was walking around the desert for however many years carrying all my belongings, I'd have a lot more than a stiff neck. It didn't really answer the question, but, you know, it's a good point. Aaron had a riot on his hands, so he made an expedient move apart from seeking God's plan. Yeah, he had, there was definitely a mutiny. You know, there's something going on here where they're like, we don't want to follow Moses anymore. And so how do you, how do you keep people united? It's a good point. After seeing these acts of God coming out of Egypt, I think they got too used to seeing God every day and felt like without seeing God in person, they couldn't continue to believe that he was with them. It's a decent guess. And, and he says, the, the writer says, that's my guess. That's a decent, you know, uh, conjecture. Um, someone else wrote proximity as comfort. So maybe Aaron made the golden calf because then God is close and that brings comfort. I wonder if the people were looking to worship a human like Moses or Aaron for their rescue. And that's a little bit in, in the passage. Good, good find. Uh, it says, as for this man, Moses, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Maybe something there. And so Aaron was attempting to redirect their worship off a human and onto an idol representation of God. But why a calf? Wouldn't you want a more powerful representation of God? It's good. Uh, he wanted to give them security. He wanted the people to have tangible, physical representation of God and to show people tangible, something to see, to be with them. Right. So here's, here's what goes on. We talk about religion reaching up and God reaching down, and, and this is what happens here is people are trying to understand God. We get into something, a technical term called syncretism. Syncretism is the idea where you take one religion and you mash it with another religion to create something new. That's syncretism. It's, it's happened in religion and in religious history for all time. We borrow religious structures and beliefs. For example, the church today has taken a ton from, well, this isn't actually a really good example, so I won't even take it. Um, no, we've taken a ton from, from Plato and the Platonic view of the world, and incorporated it into Christendom, right? So the separation of spirit and body, and we incorporated it into Christianity and said, this is what we believe. There's a little bit of syncretism going on. There's also biblical reasons for it, I understand, but I'm giving an example. So syncretism is taking another religion idea and imposing it onto our understanding of God, and it's been going on. Now, let's give context to what's going on with this calf. In the Canaanite world, which is where they're traveling in and around, the Israelite people are surrounded by other cultures. And their cultures have gods in them. The gods, or lords, are called Baals. And Baals have different hierarchical places in the flow of things. So we see that there, is, that there are Baals and they are to be worshipped in different ways like prostitution, um, for fertility. Um, they're to be worshipped in ways of offerings for better grain. They're to be worshipped in ways of, of very drastic ways all over the place. And there is one epic that tells us of a Baal the god Apis, who is a bull of Egypt. Now remember, these people have come out of Egypt. They know about Apis. And it is a bull of Egypt, of Egypt, and it is a sex god. It is a powerful symbol of reproduction. Apis, in this epic, mates with a heifer and bears a calf. This calf is to be worshipped. So in Exodus 32, 
Israel makes a golden calf, L, to worship the same way, syncretism, that the Canaanites worship Baal. So all they've done here is they've said, oh, we know this story of fertility. We know this story of God who is about making uh, things fertile and taking care of us. This is El, our provider. Come worship the golden calf who has brought us out of the land of Egypt. What we have here is syncretism. The whole episode that we're seeing is Yahweh, El, God Almighty, is distinguishing himself away from the Canaanite gods. And we're going to see how drastic this gets of Baal and Asherah. Asherah is the female sex god of fertility. They were, and, and, and Yahweh is saying, I am not them. And that is the assumption that these people have come from. So when we looked at, you know, why did, Aaron, why did Aaron make the golden calf? Yes, there's presence, but there's tradition. There's story. There's cultural familiarity. There's comfort. This is how we worship. This is how everybody else worships. So this is what we take on for ourselves. You know what's really interesting is the first commandment, Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. But I thought God was the only God. Well, we have to recognize this reality that one of my professors said this. He said, Israel was a group of polytheists, they believed in many gods, considering monotheism. That's what they were. A group of polytheists who had God in hierarchical forms who were considering monotheism. Why are they considering monotheism? Because this monotheistic God is revealing himself, and here's the commandment. You will have no other gods before me. By the time we get to the New Testament, the other gods are not gods at all, is what Paul says about them. So, so we have this, oh, this is God, and they're being, they're being showing this. But then yet, 12 chapters later, I mean, it's not fair to say 12 chapters, because we don't really know if that was, you know, 12 days, 120 days, whatever. It's 12 chapters later. These are your gods, O Israel. What? You will have no other gods before me. These are your gods, O Israel. Oh, you stiff-necked people. I don't even think Aaron's fully aware of what he's doing here. I don't think he's fully aware. I don't think he's fully conscious and cognizant that he's just taking the cultural narratives of the day and applying them to his own faith. Did you hear the warning? We must be aware in our culture that we do not simply assimilate the values of our culture and the habits of our culture simply because they sound the same as what we believe in. Think about that. Think about that. We need to be aware in our culture that we don't assimilate the values of our culture because they're using the same words as what we believe in. They might not be the exact same. They might not represent the God the way God wants to be represented today. They might sound really good and noble. But we might be practicing a little bit of cultural syncretism. We might be trying to make God instead of God making us. Someone just wrote, love is love. Someone just asked me, Rob, are you giving Aaron grace? 
that he gave this direction out of culture and tradition? Yeah, I am. I'm giving Aaron some grace. Not an excuse, grace. So look at this. Today values love, equity, inclusion, acceptance, care for the marginalized. Oh my gosh, these are awesome things. But do we just accept them because they're cultural traditions? They're ingrained in us? Or do we ask God, how do you represent these things? Do we just go with the cultural flow of this is what is? Or do we say, God, we believe that you, that you accept and that you care for the marginalized and that you love. We believe that you do that. How do you do that, God? Or do we just take the mechanisms of our culture and say, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. We'll just do that. And we'll just form a nice little golden calf here. When co-opted by the values of the world, we miss God who institutes these values. And that's what's happening at the base of Mount Sinai. And I would argue it's happening in our world today. We take God's values and leave God far behind. The people wanted to worship God, so they did what they saw other people do. And God was angry, angry with the practice of syncretism. As we get into the story, we recognize that it threatened the entire promise of God because the revelation of God himself was threatened. So God was going to work, find a workaround. Look at this, Exodus 32, 7 to 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people who brought who you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They've turned aside quickly out of the way. Somebody on Slack just mentioned how quickly these people turned aside. They turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. And they made themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to them, I've seen this people. Behold, it's a stiff-necked people. And therefore, let me alone that my wrath can burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I can make a great nation out of you. Oh. God's like, I'm done with them who aren't being careful. They're not following my way. They're assuming the ways of the culture. I'm done with them, but I'm going to be faithful to my promise to Abraham through Moses' seed only. He's going to reduce the promise back down to one. That I can make a great nation out of you. Both powerful and terrifying. God is angry. He's contemplating destroying his people who he brought out of Egypt. See the separation here? Go down for your people. The Lord says to Moses, go down for your people. It's like a parent. You ever done this with your spouse? Your kid. Right? Go down to your people because they're dough heads. They're stiff-necked. See, we need, this is a need, we need, especially today, guys, with our eyes wide open, we need God's story to define our story instead of our story defining God. Think about that. We need God's story to define our story instead of our culture's story defining God. And too often today, we get caught up in the cultural flow. And we try to define God by that. Okay, so what are some of the key markers that are culture's story? What are some of the key markers? I want to hear from you on Slack. What are some of the key markers of what you would describe our culture's narrative, our culture's story? What would they say? What would they say the markers of, of goodness and righteousness and all those, and God are, or whatever? See, the he I, I want to throw that out to you. The Hebrew people threatened the ability of God to save the world through them. God was creating a narrative and a revelation that distinguished God from the cultural observations about God. And we threaten it 
when we conflate the world's view and God's view. That's what it means for a Christian to be countercultural. We don't accept this just because it sounds good, but we put it into God says. God is the authority on this. Ultimately, it seems like they were choosing to see and worship God in the way they chose. God, help us not do that. If you don't know the story of the Bible, you will fall to counterfeits. You will fall to nice-sounding values. Oh, this sounds nice. We want to do it that way. This sounds really good. We need to know the narrative of the Bible and the revelation of God. Our culture is full. Our culture is full of interpretations about God that sound like they're good. Someone just asked, you know, is, it, is there positivity in culture's story? Is there a positive outline they have? Is it for us to fill in the blanks and to clarify like Paul did on Mars Hill in Acts 17? Right, but we need, we need to be able to say, okay, I get that you're starting with a value, but I'm starting with God. The value itself might be good. Love is good. But I'm starting with God who defines what love is and how love is. These, these values might sound like God, but they are decidedly not God. And God got angry at the people of Israel for conflating the stories, for making the things that look like God into the same thing as the revelation of God. And God was going to restore them or destroy them. So what are some of the markers? What are the markers? Um, I'll put it out to the universe. Yeah, that's part of the culture. Eye for an eye, while the world wants everything to be fair and just get even. Jesus preached love and forgiveness. It's a really, really good point. Our culture wants to filter the Bible through our current state of the world, redefining the Bible in accordance with today's mood of the week. But we need to filter culture through the Bible's understanding of it. We need culture filtered through the Bible, not the Bible filtered through the culture. Stand in your truth. Right? No. You do you. These are, these are the stories of our culture. Today we need to be aware of the God of the Bible and not be swayed by the value propositions around us that ignore that God. There are entire Christian ministries that promote God as loving who would never hurt a fly. I'm reading the Bible here. It's not quite God. There are entire Christian ministries that promote God full of anger and hatred towards certain types of people, but not others. It's also not the God I'm reading about in the Bible. There's an entire world that's riffed off the idea that Christianity co-opted their values to make their own systems, and that's also not God. We know the one true God. Don't miss this. We know the one true God through immersing ourselves in Scripture. That's where you see the revelation of God. And then it's lived out in your life and community. We immerse ourselves in Scripture first. Then we could start to say, okay, so the cultural value of, of love for the marginalized, that started with Jesus. Let's honor what Jesus was actually doing here because he's bringing people back to God through valuing the marginalized. Let's continue valuing the marginalized, but for the reason of God's glory, not for the reason of a better society. It's a big difference. We might think, oh, it's a little difference. God can't stand it when we conflate it. It's about God. This this. Loving others is about God's glory. It's to point to God. We need God's story to define our story, not our story to define God's story. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to close with this. Exodus 33, 1 to 3. The Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people who you brought up to the land of Egypt. And to land which I swore Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I'll give it. I'll send an angel before you. I'll drive out the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites, Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Go up to the land filled with milk and honey. Go. I'm not going with you. 
Go up to the land filled with milk and honey. Go. Off you go. Have the promises. Whatever. But I'm not going with you. Lest I consume you on the way. Because you're stiff-necked people. You want the promised land? Go ahead. But God says, I'm not coming. This isn't passive aggressive. This is aggressive. This is God being aggressive. Go. Off you go. Have it your way. You're being stiff neck. You're being syncretist. I'm not going with you. It's the end. Or it appears like it. God's given up on his people. He's going to fulfill the promise to Abraham, but the end of redemption of humanity is in sight because these people were stiff-necked. They started conflating cultural norms with the revelation of God. If you want to have permission to keep your things for yourself and have it your way and still claim that you follow me, yeah, go ahead. You could do that. I'm not going to be with you. If you want to have mercy and love from God and ignore my righteousness and my judgment, yeah, Go ahead, make idols for yourself and doctrines for yourself. I'm not going to be in it. You want to have it your way and do it yourself? You want control of that? Fine. Go ahead, but I'm not going to be there. Think about that, church. Do we... Do we have a heart towards God that says, God, I want you. I'm going to put no other gods before you. Or are there areas in our life where we need to repent? What does repentance look like? Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up these people, but you haven't told me whom you'll send with me. I know you by name, and you've also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider this too. This nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to them, if your presence will not go with me, don't let us leave from here. If your presence doesn't go with me, don't let us move one step further. We need to be people who pursue the presence of God and say, don't let us do one more thing unless your presence goes with us. Here's a key prayer for us today as a church. That we repent of looking towards a cultural interpretation of God. We need to repent of looking towards a cultural interpretation of God and seek God's face and see how it's different. See how it's different from the narrative of the culture. If your presence will not go with me, God, don't move us from here. We need you, God, to guide our every step. We need you, God. And so I'm actually going to invite people, invite all of us, actually, to come. And you can start playing. It's good. Whatever. It's, this is important. I want us to be a church that says, God, if your presence doesn't come with us, I don't, what are we doing? What are we doing? And if there's a place in your life where this is a, This is important. If there's something in your life that like, God, I probably need to give this up to you. And I'm gonna make these front pews available, front couple pews available. You guys can come and sit. We just need to spend some time in prayer. Genuine repentance in front of God, saying, God, there's something in my life that's holding me back. I've created a false image. Maybe I've said, you're okay with this. Maybe I've taken a cultural narrative and said, yeah, this is what I'm pursuing. And God's like, no, 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 pursue me. A holy and an awesome God. So I'm going to invite people to stand. Stand now. And in that time, consider, do you need to just pray? Come here, here, here. If your presence doesn't go with me, don't take me from here.
God, I need your presence. I need your help. He said, I am a very present help in time of need. Come and pray. As Devin leads us in song.